In this video, we are going on an exciting journey along the beautiful Australian coast, where we will embark on a mission to collect one of the most stunning and colourful fish species, the ornate rainbow fish. With its vibrant hues and playful personality, the rainbow fish is a beloved member of the aquarium hobbyist community. Join us as we explore the natural habitats of these exquisite fish. From the shallow freshwater streams that neighbour the eastern Australian coast, we will witness the awe-inspiring beauty of the natural landscape. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow, I get it now. Encounter a diverse range of aquatic creatures. What? And learn about the important role rainbow fish play in their ecosystems. Along the way, we will meet passionate fish collectors and enthusiasts who share their knowledge and experience with us and provide valuable insights into the art of rainbow fish collection and care. That was a whole mission. Look at you. Oh, no. So sit back, relax, and so get ready nice. to embark on an unforgettable journey of discovery and wonder as we go up the Australian coast to collect the ornate Radonocentris. The ornate rainbow fish, or Radonocentris, is found in a variety of freshwater habitats along the east coast of Australia. It was originally collected from a pond on Morton Island in 1914. Over their geographic range, ornate rainbow fish display a notable degree of colour variation. The species that we're targeting today is the red and blue variants located in the Great Sandy National Park. As usual, this weekend adventure starts off bright and early. Joining me on my expedition up the coast will be my girlfriend Sarah. We both thought it'd be a fun idea to go together and try and make a little bit of a weekend out of this. The Great Sandy National Park is where we'll be heading today. This is roughly a three hour drive north of Brisbane where we currently live. So in order to make the most out of the weekend, we woke up at 4am on Saturday morning and began our expedition north. Due to everyone's busy schedules, we only allowed the weekend to collect these fish. These time restraints made it crucial to have a two day plan to make sure we ticked off everything we needed to do on this trip. This morning, we'll be meeting up with our friends at Ceres Creek to catch up and enjoy some time together. It's not often that we get together and talk fish, especially in a location like this. We will spend the afternoon exploring Ceres Creek and trying to capture footage of these rainbow fish. Ceres Creek is known to be a prime location for rainbow fish, so this will be a great opportunity to practice my filming skills and enjoy the beautiful surroundings. After this, we'll be heading back to our accommodation for the night. I'm tired but I'm keen. Day 2 will be our biggest day of this trip, as we'll be heading back to Ceres Creek early in the morning to explore the environment without as much foot traffic and disturbance. Yeah, there's rad swimming here. We'll be learning about the different types of plants and animals that live in the area, and trying to best understand the conditions that these rainbow fish need to survive. We then will be catching up with everyone again to head to a secret collection point to catch these rainbow fish. This is another body of water where the rainbow fish are known to live, that is outside of National Park and at huge risk of human interference. After this, the real challenge will begin, where we will have to drive the collected fish to the fish room. This is a place where the fish will be bred and enjoyed by my staff and I in an attempt to establish a new bloodline of rads for the Australian hobby. After a long and beautiful drive up the coast, Sarah and I met up with our friends Jason and Katie at the highly popular swimming spot Ceres Creek. Ceres Creek is absolutely jam-packed full of life, and is a must-see destination here on the east coast of Australia. Jason brought his family along with him, and we absolutely loved having their company. Over the past few months, Jason and I have become very good friends. We often talk about different biotopes and creeks in the area, and all of the different species within them. Jason is an absolute wealth of knowledge, and knows far more than I do about all of the fish that we'll be seeing this weekend. Jason has been filming fish for quite a while, and has explored places and ecosystems all across Australia, so he knows an absolute ton about the things that we'll see today. We spent the first half of this day exploring the area and just checking it out. Oh my gosh. What do you think? Really cool. It is very tanny though. We didn't get up to much filming as we went here at peak time and there was plenty of people around. You might be wondering why this is a factor for filming, but what happens is when there's lots of people around, the substrate of the stream gets disturbed and creates for a very blurry image of the fish. It's really cold once you put like below your arm. No, this feels really nice. Oh! No, no, no. Once you oh! get below your legs, it's cold. Ceres oh! yeah. Creek is so different from anything I've ever experienced. 
It's a spring-fed creek which makes the water very, very cold. I'm just gonna have to dunk my whole body in it. Ready? One, two, three. Go. Tricked him. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! The second you put your body underwater, it feels like you've been dunked in ice. Oh, it's freezing. Yeah, I know. It's so cold. <gasps> you didn't have anything in your pockets, did you? Oh, the wallet. It does have a pretty consistent temperature, but it's just such an interesting environment. Since it does involve a sandy bottom, it's just such a weird phenomenon to see a white sandy substrate and fresh water flowing over the top of it. Even though our intention wasn't to film, I still was blown away the second I stuck my head under the water and saw dozens of rads swimming around my body. The water this time of the year is pretty tannin stained as a lot of the wallum and trees around the area drop their leaf litter, which releases massive amounts of tannin when exposed to rain. This water finds its way into the creek, hence the tea-coloured water. Experiencing something like this is a must-do activity for any freshwater fish-keeping nut. Personally, I think this just opens up a whole new door of appreciation for freshwater fish-keeping when doing something like this and really enjoying it with your friends. Jason and I spent some time snorkeling around the area and just soaking in the nature and appreciation that we both have for natural ecosystems and biotopes like this. But after a fair amount of time, everyone decided to wrap it up and head home for the afternoon. <laughs> Jason and his family decided to camp at Inskip Point, a very popular camping spot near Ceres Creek, but Sarah and I wanted to avoid the heat and found this beautiful little beach shack on Airbnb right on Rainbow Beach. What we're going to do now is going to go head over to this huge, massive sand mount. Once we'd settled into our accommodation, we decided to head out and try and explore right. some of the beauty that the national park has to offer. Oh, Dave and Quentin. Anyways, all right, let's go check out. Let's go check out a big pile of sand. Like we were talking about earlier, the Great Sandy National Park features a ton of sand dunes that border the east coast of Australia. Try and go further up, maybe. So, what? Where do you reckon we just go? Walk up there? There's a walk track kind of area up there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was just here. How do you get there? Never went the wrong way. I think 100% we did. It says 720 meters to the car park. Yeah, but the sand boy is literally just there. I see it. There's a lot of sand. We should cut through it. Oh yeah. Whoa! What? That is a lot of sand. Wow. Only saying? in Australia is it a tourist attraction to just go to this place where there's just a heap of sand. Like, well, let's just go here with this. Sandals thing. off. Let's go. Whoa. Wow. We. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, this was definitely oh. worth it. Whoa. Whoa, I get it now. The stone's throw away from the place we're staying is this huge sand dune that Sarah and I decided to go up to the top of. Wow. It might just look like a big pile of sand to you guys on screen. But seeing something like this in person just absolutely blows you off your feet. Go run, I dare you. <laughs> Why are you skipping like that? You kind of start to realize how small you are in an environment like this. Or maybe I should say how big you are. Ready? I'll go. Yeah, I'll run down first. Go. He doesn't run. There's just this overwhelming feeling of vastness when looking at the ocean, and we definitely felt this right on top of the sand dunes. The amount of sand that's built up here is just unfathomable. Sarah and I had a great time down here, and walked all the way down the sand dunes to dip our toes in the Pacific Ocean. Alrighty, off we go. We're gonna go collect them now, I guess. Collect them now, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Day two also started off bright and early with a nice little 5.30 a.m. wake up. I'm tired, but I'm keen. Yeah, I'm tired too. Sarah and I packed all our gear into the car and headed straight to Ceres Creek, which is only about a 10 minute drive from the place we're staying. Okay, we're here, let's go. Like I was saying earlier, Ceres Creek is a popular swimming spot, so it's not too far off the beaten track. It does feature a lot of boardwalks and decks surrounding the creek, so it's nowhere too remote. It's heaps quieter than yesterday at least. Yeah. That's good because it means that people are going to be stirring up the water less. So hopefully we can see all the little crayfish in that. Yeah, and the catfish. There's heaps of caddies. Yeah, like huge. 
But with excellent protection over this area, the creek does remain relatively untouched, which makes for great viewing underwater. Look at that. That is the most beautiful creek you'll probably ever see. That's insane. It's crystal clear. It's a little bit of tannin, but other than that, that's awesome. You gonna go under? No, I'm gonna. No, just submerge in there. Yeah, it's definitely icy. Wow. It's really cold in here. Like I often say, the camera just doesn't do this place justice. It's almost impossible to capture the beauty of a place like this within the lens. There's just an energy that a place like this carries, which can't be described. There's radnocentris everywhere. There's little gudgeons there. Yeah, the gudgeons are really big. There's fish everywhere. Yeah, you can see them swimming right there. After walking down to the creek, Sarah and I put a snorkel on <laughs> and jumped in the creek to fully observe the untouched oh, you water. You kind of look like the guy from um, Back to the Future. What guy? <laughs> the mad scientist. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> Before exploring the underwater environment, you must get over the challenge of putting your head underwater into the natural spring, which I think was about 16 degrees at the also, time. Cold? No, it's fine. It's really good. You should get in there. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Go, you go haven't dunk your head on that. Go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But once you get over this, the creek is yours to explore. <sighs> Dude, this is so cool. It's like the coolest thing ever for a no, freshwater fish keeper. It's really fun. It's like a full, it's just like a dive in aquascape. Dude, not even for a freshwater fish keeper, just for anyone. <laughs> I don't but, do fish. You're just swimming down there, and then all around you is rads. Mm, it's really awesome. Everywhere. You might get sick of me saying this, but this place just comes alive with a set of goggles on. The creek is absolutely filled full of rainbow fish. The ones here are red and blue, with some of them having a mix between the two colours. At first I thought this was just the rads flaring their breeding colours, which they probably were because it was the morning, but with some later research we figured out that this is just part of their genetics. But the rads are not the only organisms sharing this body of water. The Tandanus catfish, also known as the eeltail catfish, is a fascinating species that plays an important role here in the creek. They are opportunistic predators, feeding on a variety of aquatic invertebrates and small fish. And all of these little rainbow fish and gudgeons are on the menu. During the breeding season, male Tandanus catfish will establish territories in the shallower parts of the waterways. Tandanus catfish, like many other species of catfish, are known to construct nests. This male is currently guarding his nest of eggs from all the other fish in the area. And he's even been clever enough to cover up his nest with a series of botanicals and leaf litter that he's collected in the area. The male swims in circles around the nest to fully observe the surroundings and protect the eggs from predation. This male has spotted a threat to the nest and briefly abandons his spawn to protect his territory from a neighbouring male with a nest downstream. However, while the male is gone, this creates an interesting opportunity for some of the smaller fish in the area. Gudgeons are a common micro-predator here in the creek. The rads nearby see this and also join in on the feast. The male soon returns, bringing an end to the ambush. But the gudgeons and rainbows sit and wait patiently for their next opportunity to have a feast. While exploring, we also found many other interesting invertebrates and fish. Something I found very interesting which Jason pointed out to me was the thriving population of a small endangered species known as the Oxalan Pygmy Perch. Oxalan Pygmy Perch are listed as an endangered species here in Australia due to threats such as habitat loss, water pollution, and competition with introduced fish species. We didn't notice any introduced fish species here in Ceres Creek, which might be a key reason in the abundant population of pygmy perch. It's so good that a place like this is protected, but like you saw all the pine farms and stuff around this area, it's very likely that all of that area could just instantly become this. Not this spot in particular, but a lot of the area and habitat of yeah. these fish could just get completely wiped out by those And this those is farms. right off the road as well, so... It's just amazing to think that freshwater fish inhabit only a tiny fraction of the world's water, as freshwater makes up just 1% of the total water on the planet. And despite this, freshwater fish are also incredibly diverse, with well over 18,000 species known to science, and much more that are definitely undiscovered. 
This highlights the incredible adaptability of these fish, as they've been able to thrive in a relatively limited and often challenging environment. You couldn't even quantify everywhere you look there's life. And it's just so amazing because when you think about it, you walk around in the bush, yeah, it's a kind of similar, you see a lot of life, but it's so concentrated in a puddle of water. Unfortunately, freshwater habitats are increasingly threatened by pollution and habitat destruction, making it even more important to appreciate the amazing diversity and resilience of freshwater fish. After we'd spent a bit of time swimming in the creek, I wanted to take you guys for a walk down the creek to show you how amazing this little environment is. You can see here that there's just tons of this algae stuff growing here. It's like a hair algae sort of thing. This is what we're trying to mimic when we create spawning mops. And it's really interesting to see it in the wild because I can actually see in here, there's two males sparring, coloring up, trying to entice females to come lay eggs in here. Rainbow fish, rads, all the species of rainbow fish basically lay eggs every day in the morning. So right now, it's about 8.30 a.m. This is their spawning time. So we're looking at the rainbow fish as they're breeding in their morning colors. Honestly, it's, it's like lost for words sort of thing where you're somewhere like this and you're seeing what we have in our aquariums in nature. It's like, I don't know, especially as someone who breeds all these fish, it gets kind of crazy. So. Another really fascinating thing about this ecosystem is the lack of abundance of massive trees. Trees do get large, but are not able to turn into massive rainforests down near the sea. Due to the ground being mostly made up of sand, it makes it really hard for trees to establish massive root systems and turn into massive rainforests. It's pretty amazing here because it's super narrow, so like I could basically touch both sides of the bank, but underneath it really spreads out because what happens is all these roots are holding together the sides of the creek. Fish live in and amongst all the roots and they breed in amongst it. There's carp gudgeons, there's all sorts of gudgeons in here, there's shrimp. This is what sustains the habitat. So it's just amazing to see like white sand creek and fresh water. It's just so cool. Mm. This is actually starting to really pick up its flow here. It's really just going down and down and down. Something I've learned about in the last year with rainbows is they love flow. I reckon what people should be doing with their rainbow tanks is you chuck a power head in the corner and then just have it flowing for most of the day. And then at night, maybe you can turn it off just if you want to let them relax. Just to let those males run into the stream and work out and do what they would do in the wild. It's, it's gushing and gushing here. And the rainbows just sit in there and they just, they really, really love it. Yeah, there's rad swimming here. They like the spot where everyone is swimming because I think they stir up the substrate and make their food. Anyways, let's go back. Just have a chill out on the swim. After another good few hours here at Ceres Creek, we met up with Jason to head off to a collection point outside the National Park where we can legally take a few of these fish. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Mm. <laughs> that was so nice. Yeah, it was awesome. I love hey. that. The swamp we're headed to is only a 20 minute drive away from Ceres Creek. Most of the time when people think of collecting fish, they think we go to these amazing and beautiful areas to collect them. Most of the time, they're just on the side of the road near some kind of drain or some kind of construction site. Just on this dirt track. Yeah, no, we're just parking You don't want to be taking fish from pristine environments. You want to be taking them from somewhere where they're actually at risk of being lost. People often forget that aquarists actually play a huge role in the conservation of different species across the world. A lot of the times governments and councils ruin areas and ecosystems and actually have to turn to aquarists with aquarium populations of fish to restock these areas after they've ruined them. It's super important that we have an abundant population of every single species within aquaria to give all of these wild fish an insurance policy on their species. And I think that aquarists are doing a great job at making sure that these fish are protected from extinction. Are you excited? Yes, of course. Got the traps in there. Everything else. Cool. So to respect the animals most, we like to go to these spots where it's firstly legal to collect them and also the fish is at high risk of being lost there anyways. In some of our previous adventures, we've been lacking a crucial tool in our toolkit. Oh mate, these rocks are rough on your feet. They're very, very sharp. <sighs> Water shoes. Your kicks? Yeah. Jason's got his on. Probably putting them on, Nick. So we get more grip? Yeah. Because last time... We wore these. Someone in particular was slipping over. Oh my, god. oh my god! We've been victims to slipping and falling over in countless different creeks and I finally decided today's the day where this ends. What can we expect to see down here? 
Jubilee eyes, striped gudgeons, rads, honey blue eyes. Where's this gudgeon territory? Yeah. I think we'll go further up. We're only after the rads. This Let me go first, there's a lot of snakes here. I've actually seen snakes here, but brown snakes. Oh, yuck. Oh, wait. There's this one big lake where there's actually a rope swing to hop into the water. But further up from this lake is a little stream that trickles into here. It's going to be fine getting across, but then getting back with a bucket of water and fish. Oh, he's going to do a bit more It's not very Slippery. deep, is it? Okay. You've got to climb over the rocky structures and go underneath this drain to get to the best collecting spot. Don't look in the water, it's very slippery. Yeah, there's honey blue eyes. All the little ones are honey blue eyes and they're endangered, so we can't capture those. It is crucial to not disturb populations of this species when collecting our desired rainbow fish from the various swamps in the Great Sandy National Park, as collection of this species is forbidden. To catch these specific fish, we thought it'd be a great idea to use traps. Sometimes you can use nets, but the way that rads and rainbow fish swim, potty mullet traps like the ones we have here are often the best option, and they're also legal. To bait these guys into the traps, we just use a little bit of cat food, as this lets off a fishy smell in the water, and attracts some of the invertebrates and fish to it. Set up here. After walking further down the creek, Sarah and I found a nice spot where we think the traps might be able to collect a few different rainbow fish. Take the traps and then chuck them in here. There's no real science to this, just throw the traps in and see what happens. Look how tannin it is, the traps disappear. Yeah, you can't even see it. Normally we like to leave the traps for at least 10 minutes before coming back and checking them. We'll tie it up and what we'll do is we grab this one. It doesn't take too long for fish to find them. And usually, you're going to catch something within the first 10 minutes if you're even going to catch something at all. I'll try and chuck this one so it's belly down because the food's on the bottom there. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, now it's just wait and see what we catch. So while the traps were set, we decided we were going to do a test on the water parameters within this ecosystem to see the pH and TDS levels to best mimic this environment in our aquariums. We're going to do a little water test. We're going to do TDS first. All right, chuck her in. You see where? Yep. 63. Three. 63 parts per million. Nice. All right, what do you reckon? I reckon the pH is like 6. Yeah, because of the tannin, I think. For all you that don't know, Sarah actually has a biomedical science degree, so. Hey, what are you doing raiding my trap? <laughs> Three careful drops. Cool. It's oh yellow. Oh my gosh, that's very. Like, yeah, see. pH fix. Wow. They love it. Yeah. Nice. All right. It'd be hard to get that in the tank, though. You don't want to do that in the tank. You know They'll crash. Pressure. Yeah. My test kit only goes down to about six, but I reckon the pH was even lower than this. And that makes sense with the amount of tannin in the water. All of the botanicals that fall into the water off the trees contribute to humic acids in the water, which create an acidic environment and hence a low pH. After we tested the water, it was time to check the traps. Let's go and check these traps. And this is when the real work began. The heat for the day had really settled in and the humidity was super high. It's really hot. The second we started doing a bit of physical labor, we started sweating. Oh. <laughs> Note to self, next time bring a better bucket. There's a likely chance it could be some honey blue eyes in here. What we're going to do, these guys are actually endangered. We're going to have a quick look and we're going to throw them back in because we cannot keep these. And I don't want to harm them. What? Come See. in. Oh, you. Oh, wow. wow. Look. Whoa. We've got a rad though, for sure. Oh, nice. Look at There's that. There's so much, so many shrimp over there. There's you know, gudgeon. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that big crayfish? That's awesome. It's important that if you guys go and do this, that you're very responsible with what you catch. And that you only take what you need and what you can care for. Because and also what you're allowed to. And what you're allowed to as well, because you're not allowed to take most of this stuff. The first trap was absolutely chocked full of different species. Look at that. Look at that. They can jump, they're like popcorn. But look at this guy. What is that? It's a crimson spotted. Oh, dude, that's beautiful. All right, well we've already got a few of those, so we don't need that. What about this, this guy over here? This that's a gudgeon. It's crayfish out. She's pregnant, so I want to get her back in. Ready? How do you know she's pregnant? She, you can see it on her belly. Oh, bye. We'll use a net to fish out. Look at that. There's a little gudgeon there. We'll throw back all the double eyes. We do have a few rads, I think. That's a rad there. Beautiful. And we also found a few of our desired radinocentris in here. 
These look like the blue form, but I was still super happy to see them in the traps. Dude, I can't believe we found rads. Because we headed further up the creek, so cool. the water was a little bit deeper, and this isn't an ideal habitat for honey blue eyes. We didn't find one single honey, which is really interesting. This might be a honey. No, it's a little gudgeon. All the honeys are in the shallow water, which is good because we don't want to touch them. I don't want to hurt them at all. Look at that. That's a beautiful fish. I'm sorry, I just don't want to, I don't want to keep them out of water. But... So how many do we have? Only a few. They're not all rads. We've got to go check the other trap. Okay, let's go. It's just this. here. Imagine you drop this whole thing. Let's go. Oh, it's heaps more in here. Very All right, nice. here, quick, 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 quick. Nice. quick, quick, quick. Get them in the water. <laughs> There's a lot in here. Oh yeah. We really quick. We'll flip this. I really don't want to hurt these. Yeah, there's definitely rads in here too. Nice. There's some nice ones in here. It's not a friendly, it's not a crayfish or anything. No, good. Wow. We'll filter out everything now. Oh, look at... Whoa! Whoa. Little short arm prawn. Ooh, is that a rad? Yep. Cool. There's only little baby rads here, that's all right. We only ended up catching about 12 of these guys. And this is perfect because the legal amount of these that you're allowed to take is up to 20 of each species, including the ones that you have in possession at home. That's a little baby rad. Wow, well. they're not really that pretty, they're just brown. Yeah, once you get them in a tank, they're all stressed. That's the main thing. Oh, I see. After we'd checked both the traps, we'd caught what we needed and it was time to try and get these guys back to Brisbane. We were kind of chasing the clock here as we were running out of daylight because we had about a three and a half hour drive home Carrying around an esky box full of water without a lid is not an easy task, especially when you're walking over the rocky terrain that we have in front of us. Getting these fish back to the car was one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my fish keeping career. Can you help? We walked about 250 metres back to where the car was parked with an open esky box through slime over the rocks in searingly hot heat. Hey, okay, you got this. Come to go down? Yeah. Merit back. In the end, it was all worth it. Dude, that was a whole mission. Look at you. I know. Oh. To get these guys home, there was a few different ways we could preserve the fish in transport. A common way is to have a bucket with an air stone, but due to the relatively small distance we had to go home and the fish only having to survive for a couple hours in a bag, we thought that bagging these guys would be the best way to do it. We've decided to take 12 in total. So we'll bag them up in bags of four. Cool. As much air in there as we can. Wow. God, I might pass it out soon. I know, it's really f***ing hot. Okay, I'm so sorry you have to sit through this. Three bags, cool. Then they were stored in the back of the car in an air-con environment to not overheat. <laughs> that was so crazy. You loved it. Huh? You loved it. I did. I actually did think it was cool. It just got too much, don't you think? Yeah, it was If we can get back to Brisbane quick smart and get him in the fish room, acclimating and with new water. How'd you like that? The whole weekend? The whole weekend I loved. Like everything about it. That last like 30 minutes of just trying to catch those fish. That was so stressful trying to carry them down. That's part of it. Like yeah. you have to go and do that stuff. And like yeah. it's gross. And like I can't wait to have a shower and all that. But yeah. Well, we had a good weekend. Yeah, it was really fun. And like I won't forget it ever. No. And that place is like magical. I then drove three hours south back to Brisbane and dropped Sarah home on the way. By the time I got back to the fish room, the sun was well and truly coming down and the fish were already reaching their expiry date. I quickly unbagged these guys and began drip acclimating them into my water. I acclimated these guys into my water for a good two hours and then carefully introduced them into the tank. It's now been a good month since we got these fish into the fish room and I'm here to let you guys know how they're going. All of our rads have been doing absolutely fantastic in the fish room and we actually already have babies. 
It took them a little while to settle in because being in a fish tank is vastly different from that of a wild environment. But I'm happy to report that all the fish have settled in well. I've been feeding them tons of different live foods, including worms and live baby brine shrimp to fatten them up. They all look amazing and I can't wait to see how these offspring turn out. Will we get a few red ones? I'm not too sure. All of the fish we collected are of the blue variant, so it's going to be super interesting to see whether they throw out red or red and blue fish in the future. This was one of the most fun weekends I've had in a really long time, and I absolutely enjoyed all the company and guidance that everyone gave me on this trip. Without Jason's experience, we couldn't have done it, so a massive thanks to him. Also a massive thanks to Sarah for dealing with me and my fish stuff over the few days. It takes a lot of resilience for someone who's not into fish to go out and collect fish in the searingly hot heat and help get them back to Brisbane, so thank you. And thank you to you guys for watching this video. If you guys enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and I'll see you guys in the next one.